Rory and Dara from Youth Mappers um, are going to discuss. Uh, can you hear me? Did I unmute myself? Yes, I unmute myself. Are going to discuss uh, how their community is continuing to uh, remain resilient in this 100% virtual world. Um, I'll let them introduce uh, Youth Mappers, but it's basically a uh, global network of uh, mapping enthusiasts that are coming together, especially in uh, developing countries or uh, lower income countries, uh, try to build up mapping capacity globally. So um, Rory and uh, Dara, you want to take it over? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think maybe I'll start it off. Um, Dara, if you could share your, your screen with the slides maybe, then I'll kick yes. it over to you. Can everyone see that? Oops. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's good. Cool, yeah, so uh, my name is Rory. Uh, I'm a contractor at the US Agency for International Development or USAID. Um, I work at a place called the Geo Center, um, which helps our agency take a geographic approach to international development. Um, <clears throat> so this means we support uh, USAID missions and uh, which are basically our offices, which are based around the world, um, as well as our DC based bureaus uh, with using geospatial technology, analysis, visualization, and uh, yeah, basically to use those things to support their projects. Um, an example of this would be uh, maybe uh, in Mozambique, um, we're helping map uh, health facilities and their catchment areas um, to find gaps in service provision. Um, so the Ministry of Health can use uh, these or target their mobile clinics for um, targeting different parts of the population that don't fall in those catchment areas. Um, then some maybe more of the regular mundane work we do is mapping like where is USAID allocated its money, where are our projects, um, what types of funds are being spent and where. Um, so that's USAID. Then within USAID, within the Geo Center where I work, I help manage uh, something called the Youth Mappers Project, um, which uh, is a consortium of schools um, and it was founded in 2015, um, started by GW, um, you can probably see those on the screen, Texas Tech, uh, West Virginia University. And then uh, Arizona State has kind of taken over things as time has moved on. Um, shout out to Richard, who's uh, part of the GW uh, Youth Mappers chapter, the faculty there leading things away and a happy Canada Day, right? Um, I think it's today. Um, yeah, so what is Youth Mappers? Uh, basically, it is uh, open mapping clubs at universities around the world, including the US and Canada. Um, and the students map for USAID projects, basically, in support of USAID's projects and our uh, USAID's mission as a whole. Um, so I think we're at over 210 chapters right now. Um, and they're all operating more or less uh, during the COVID pandemic. And they're mostly uh, doing mapping projects in OpenStreetMap. Um, I'm sure most of the people here are familiar with OpenStreetMap, but it, uh, just in case you're not, um, it's Google, Google Maps meets Wikipedia. Um, so anyone can create an account and add data to this kind of geospatial database. Um, and a lot of large institutions use it, um, like the Department of State, shout out to Erica, who presented at GODC a couple times before and is online today. Uh, the UN uses it. Um, American Red Cross, but also large companies like Snapchat and Facebook and Mapbox. Um, and also related to OpenStreetMap, um, I think uh, last month they've reached a record number of new re newly registered mappers and as well as uh, active maps uh, mappers editing the map in a single day. So it's this vastly growing um, geospatial database and it's really exciting that we can bring kind of university students into the fold and that they can help USAID development um, priorities um, with open geospatial data. And I'll leave it at that and kick it over to Dara to talk about how we've been operating during these times of quarantine. Okay. Hi everyone, and so I'm Youth Mappers Communication Specialist. And right now the image that's showing is a representation of all the 
recorded edits uh, by youth mappers. So over the years from 2015 to now, so you um, heard Rory saying the different projects that youth mappers participate in. Those projects can be established by USAID or our partners at Missing Maps or Humanitarian Open Street Map Pot initiatives. But students are also able to choose any uh, OSM Open Street Map project that they would like to contribute to, and then that's reflected on this map. And if you want to check it out, you can go to activities.youthmappers.org or go on our website and you'll see the live look at where students are mapping. Um, you would expect that due to the pandemic, many of the students being in rural areas, possibly not having access to Wi-Fi because that's where they um, they go to the university, they get access to Wi-Fi, you would expect that there would be a decrease in mapping contributions. However, at our last steering committee meeting, which was just last week, we um, learned that there it's actually staying pretty steady as far as the number of edits, all things considering um, with the pandemic. So I think that really speaks to the students' resolve as far as finding resources, finding the way to still um, do those edits, even considering all the circumstances, and then also um, their drive and results to still benefit their community. And something that's been really impressive is the COVID-19 relief efforts that the students have taken part in, in response to the pandemic and how that they've been applying their mapping skills and becoming leaders and creating resilient communities, which is one of, that's our mission, is uh, part of the mission is to, uh, teach the students and uh, have them develop and support resilient communities. So students have started new projects and they've also participated in local projects. And I've highlighted three examples of those. So first, mapping community resources in Dutchess County. So this was started by the Hudson Valley mappers and the president of the club, Adele, is actually on the call right now. So if you wanna hear more about the um, project itself, I think talking to her after, she can um, talk a little bit about it would be great. But to give a quick rundown of it, so essentially it's an interactive of online map, web map of community resources and businesses in Dutchess County, New York. And it included food pantries, meal programs, school meal distribution sites, health services, including coronavirus testing facilities, shelters, grocery stores with senior hours, farmers, um, markets, and emergency childcare programs, bike shops, and free outdoor Wi-Fi. And community partners were able to update this web map frequently. So they worked with their community to um, edit and add all this information. Next is the um, Uganda, the geo mappers in Uganda who uh, partnered with OSM Uganda. And what they did is they applied for a hot micro grant, which was funding for COVID-19 response. And then they are mapping the entry border points to support the Uganda Red Cross Society and Ministry of Health. We all know that kind of those points where people are traveling, that's potentially where hotspots could be. So that was their goal with that project. And finally, the third project, Impacts of COVID-19. Um, survey was you used Kobo Toolbox Community Survey that focused on collection information to identify situations of economic vulnerability, family and gender violence, community health and well-being during the national lockdown in Mindian, Min, I, Mindian uh, Colombia. And there were 400 responses in the first two weeks. So basically this was a survey to see what the impacts outside of COVID-19 would be in the community. And that was initiated by regional <coughs> ambassadors in Colombia. And so speaking to this uh, final point on the regional ambassadors before we started, the uh, before the pandemic started the regional ambassadors were already established interacting in their communities so that's also allowed us to stay connected globally even though the students may not um they're not able to meet the and we may not understand all of the different circumstances that are happening in all of the other countries the regional ambassadors are able to um, have a stronger connection with the students because they can see it from a regional context of how the pandemic and um, is affecting that area. 
Finally, we've uh, started online sessions and the Youth Mappers Network or headquarters have flood specifically um, six. And with those sessions, we um, have done them in English, French and Portuguese. So there's been different panels and the overall arching what have we've had training so Rory has thankfully led um, trainings for us we had a meet and greet and then student and alumni pan panels and um, what we found speaking back to the previous presentation that if they're student moderators and to that leads to the most participation so having the students actually uh, lead the questions and have like a host and then a student or have the student as part of it they're able to kind of nudge other people to um, speak up and continue with the conversation. And you all mentioned at the beginning that your picture on GODC is a picture of with the research fellows from 2018. They are actually having a, a presentation next Thursday that's going to be part of our online session series. So if you want to see the 2018 research fellows you can tune in with that and you can uh, see the details on our social media once we have those up and while we've led while well, like youth mappers headquarters has started these online sessions there's been countless mapathons and meetings held virtually by chapters so the university students themselves have connected virtually and um, to keep the keep the program going and finally Flexibility with our programs, I think, has been a main part of how um, we've been able to move on and keep rolling with uh, the pandemic. So an example would be our research fellows. They were supposed to come to D.C. in June, and we have had to evaluate and pivot, basically focusing on the safety, but still providing a same um, level of training and experiential learning that was our goal in starting the program. And then we also had a field work program that obviously it's not safe to go out and do field work right now. So we're also evaluating how to apply that remotely. So just taking a step back and seeing how can we still uh, get that and it provide the experiential learning and opportunities for the students. So finally, um, as you can see, our motto is we don't just build maps, we build mappers. So really focusing on what we can do for the students and building these skills that they can take outside of the classroom and apply it professionally as well. And ultimately, youth mappers enable students to define their world by mapping it. So if you want to learn more about the projects that I just mentioned, you can go to youthmappers.org and then specifically on the blogs, you can go to youthmappers.org slash blog and I'll put those um, links in the chat so you can learn about those stories of COVID-19 relief efforts. And now we can open it up to questions. Awesome presentation, that was fantastic. Any questions, anyone? And I should probably open it up. Adele, if you want to add anything, feel free right now, because I know I went over that really quickly and it'd be great to hear from your perspective. Yeah, I think, well, I think your summary was great. Um, yeah, so we founded Hudson Valley Mappers at Vassar College uh, in fall of 2018. And since then we've been focusing a lot on community mapping projects um, in partnership with the local government and nonprofits, um, working on housing justice and other issues in the city of Poughkeepsie. And through um, our COVID resource mapping project, we continued those partnerships virtually and met with our community partners to ask about what they wanted to see on the map. So they identified specific resources um, such as um, food pantries and meal programs, grocery stores that have senior hours, um, coronavirus testing facilities. So I put the link to the um, web map in the chat so you can take a look at the map. We're not currently updating it um, anymore, but um, at the time that we were, you know, for the first couple um, months of the pandemic, we did have a team of about uh, 12 um, people. So Vassar students and faculty, as well as our community partners who all had access to um, our Google Sheets spreadsheet and they would update the spreadsheet as more information about different resources became available. Um, and then those changes were automatically reflected in our ArcGIS online um, web app. Yeah. 
You were all so thorough. No one has questions because it was an amazing presentation. <laughs> Anything anyone wanted to add? I can uh, add. So, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just say I have a question. Um, I'm curious what the breakdown in activity with the youth mappers is in, say, um, U.S. versus um, you know globally. Um, you know, so I, mean, I know it's a it's a global program. It's funded by USAID. So there's the kind of the pre-March activity, and I'm just wondering how that how that looks compared to today. So, I mean, you mentioned that it stayed relatively stable overall, but I'm just wondering if there's any geographic variability in those activity levels. Yeah, I don't, we haven't crunched the numbers on that necessarily yet, but um, most of the, a lot of the chapters um, kind of outside the U.S. have expressed difficulties accessing kind of Wi-Fi and computers because a lot, of, that's where they got a lot of their internet access from was at computer labs in the university kind of. Um, you know, harkens back to, you know, 20 years ago in the States or whatever, 30 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, like they still have access to, you know, WhatsApp and kind of limited internet access on their phones so they can communicate and they can chat. Um, but kind of the in-depth kind of mapping we're hoping for them to do um, has gotten a lot more difficult. And so we're exploring different ways to maybe provide micro grants for, um, uh, just providing, you know, getting internet for them at their homes. Maybe just kind of, oh. yeah, maybe just kind of related to that. I mean, are there ways to, uh, I remember back in the day there was sort of the paper based aspect of OpenStreetMap, like you just print out or something and, and mark a piece of paper and then you can just take a photo. I, I'm sure you still need internet in some field level. Field papers? Yes, field papers, thank you. Is that something yeah. worth exploring? Yeah, um, we, we would love to increase that as pe countries come out of lockdown, but uh, still people were kind of, you know, I wouldn't consider that an essential kind of activity for a lot of these places and I don't, we trust our communities to make the right decision, the chapters to say, hey, we feel comfortable uh, doing some field mapping with field papers or not. Um, and we, we, we have given trains on that in the past, um, before my time, but uh, Chad Blevins has, has, has done that in the past. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just a, you know, with over 200 chapters, there's 200 different local laws and issues around quarantining and lockdown and different countries are at different stages of opening up. And so it's just it, taking it on a case by case basis, seeing where chapters are comfortable doing that type of work. Yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I imagine that maybe they just like had in mind what they could with and doing it in their home <laughs> instead yeah. of having to do it a, a, out in the field. But yeah, no, absolutely. You definitely want to do some of these things safe. Yeah, um, there's, there, there's one website that's called um, healthsites.io. Um, which is a way to add uh, health site information into OpenStreetMap. Oh. And uh, we kind of did a global call for our youth mappers because they do have a lot of this like local knowledge. Um, you know, with OpenStreetMap, it's easy for, you know, armchair mappers here in the US to digitize roads and buildings from satellite imagery. But oftentimes we don't have that kind of ingrained local knowledge of right. what those buildings actually are. Is it a residential building? Is it a, a commercial building? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we did a global call for our uh, mappers to um, basically add health site information, but attribute information, hours of operation, mm -hmm. um, number of beds and types of uh, care that these different places offer. And I think at one point when we ran the numbers in May, we were about, a youth mappers contributed to about a quarter of all edits mm -hmm. through healthsites.io to OpenStreetMap, which was really awesome. And uh, touching on another thing that students can do while we're like Wi-Fi is still a concern, but having access to like phones is a little bit easier. Uh, with Sierra Leone, we're doing a real electrification project uh, with 
several partners. Um, it's on our projects page if you really want to check it out. And Mapillary has an option, like there's two stages of Mapillary. So we're mapping the buildings, the roads, and the utility poles to assess uh, a rural electrification there. And with the Mapillary, you can go on your phone and just swipe through pictures, like saying if this is a utility pole or not. So there's a few different um, opportunities that we're trying to put out there that may not require as much Wi-Fi as you would normally like want for traditional like mapping. Uh, we have a question, what is the percent of USA chapters versus international chapters and where are the international chapters by continents and countries? I'm going to pull up the um, map real quick to show that to y'all share screen again. For the US, if I'm quoting my numbers right, maybe I don't quote me, I think it's about 40 US chapters and then in total we have 212. So let me just share the screen. Did that do it? Nope, that's not the right screen. Okay, sorry y'all. Too many transitions. Okay. So there we go. Now can we see it? And I will say we did have recent chapters um, and we're having a little bit of difficulty with our mapping. So this map is not completely uh, up to date, but you can see that there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of chapters in Africa and that was that's shown throughout the 2015 like they started joining as inaugural chapters. And I know like I recently joined the team. Um, Rory, I don't know if you want to speak to this or maybe Richard. If we have any more questions on that. I think you dropped off for a second, Dara, but um, yeah, I think we were always looking to grow our chapters. And, and one of the things that Dara mentioned in her presentation was our regional ambassador program, which are, uh, I believe they're alumni of, of youth mappers. Um, kind of ones who excelled and participated in like research fellowships and they help um, kind of mentor regionally different chapters to make sure there's that continuity uh, of kind of like leadership and, and, and skills um, because you know you do cycle through students every four years or so and you do lose some institutional knowledge every every four years with that so it just helps keep things going basically. I have another question. That's all right. Um, I like the uh, the point you're making of you don't just build maps, you build mappers. Because um, I've been having some conversations with some folks in the crowdsourcing student science kind of area where, um, you know, some of them can can just be these like very repetitive tasks. I know mapathons can tend to be that way. That's why mapathons are more fun because it's meant to be a social event. Um, but I'm wondering how how do you kind of I think you talked about it, but like how do you really explain or communicate how they did learn these mapping skills and were able to translate it for things like COVID or whatever it might be, um, or career skills or whatever it is. Yeah, Richard or, or Dara, please jump in. But what I would say is um, one of my roles, I feel like a lot of the times is to kind of act as that kind of, I don't wanna say guardian, but that maybe that buffer between our students and some of the projects we could be working on um, because some of them do seem a little Right, they're not this. They're, they are mapping for free, but it's to to build mappers and not just to generate data for you know a certain project or corporation. You know, we want those skills built, um, and so we 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 turn down a lot of projects that we could potentially work on just because they. I don't. We don't see the students getting enough out of it as you know the the, the other project would. And we at, as at youth mappers, we like to see our you know uh, students. Um, to develop further with technology within the geospatial community and, and we you know we we would like to see them uh, move forward and that's one of the things that we're we sort of started to talk about in the last year or so it's like well how has youth members impacted their uh, professional growth and where they work are they working in stem are they working in different industries where are they working and so we're starting to you know trying to we're starting to ask those questions to figure out okay how do we actually um, determine that and if youth mappers has had a positive hopefully in, impact on their you know their job and their career trajectory 
Um, but I know, it, you know, in, in one case anyway, we had one um, student who was a youth mapper from Nepal who was part of our very first um, leadership fellowship, which took place actually in, in Kathmandu in Nepal. And he is now, um, he's finished his master's and has been hired at one of the universities in Nepal and actually is one of our regional ambassadors as well. So he is sort of, he came to us as an, as an undergraduate, as uh, one of our fellows. And then now he's went on obviously this master's and has been hired by a university and now is a mentor to other uh, undergraduate students and stuff in, in that university in the geospatial side. So we're looking to see how we can um, quantify, I guess, in some measure, the effect that youth backers has had on various um, uh, various students, you know, lives and, and their career paths and such. It's, it's very hard to sort of tie those together. We're trying to see how we can actually sort of work those. But I know Sarov, who is in, in Kathmandu, is certainly an example of a youth mapper we got as an, uh, as an undergrad. And he was very much an active member of his youth mapper's chapter, went on to his master's, now has been hired by a university, and is now a mentor in his university um, to other youth mappers and such. So that's, that's the kind of stuff we love to see, obviously, um, but we don't have a concrete way to actually tie those sort of things together at this, at this time, but it's something we, we want to see, we want to encourage, we want to develop. And speaking from a communications perspective, whenever we're reaching out as far as um, publish, publishing, like my role is to amplify students' voices and talking to different organizations explaining youth mappers, the goal is to not just focus on like the product or like the supply that the students provided, but also what skills they're learning and then like growing from that. So that's also a focus as far as like the story, um, not just like this. I mean, ma like it's it's amazing what you can do with mapping, but then also what what it's doing for the students themselves. And then I, um, I guess I can kind of go personal. I was pre-Youth Mappers. I did a project with Patricia and Marcella before Youth Mappers was established, and I've been mapping since um, eighth grade. Not not like professionally, not anything like really technical. Um, so I, I, Youth Mappers itself like supports the students and with the regional ambassadors programs and the like the alumni and then um, coming back, we're finding ways to strengthen that. Um, and I don't know how much time we have for other questions, but there's one more question. Uh, can we talk about it or not? Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay, um, so Matthew asked what kind of projects do you guys do by topic? Uh, I think from a overarching, uh, as far as our goal is being humanitarian mapping and supporting resiliency in communities, that that would be uh, the larger framework of the project supporting uh, communities and local development. But again, the chapters can choose what communities that they want to do. Um, but Rory, if you want to add on to that, feel free. Yeah, it's broadly in support of US development goals, uh, whether it's support, supporting a specific project. Um, I think one of our most successful pro, uh, youth mappers mapping project was uh, related to malaria sprain in Mozambique. Um, basically, um, to prevent the, an outbreak of malaria, you need to spray, I think, I'm going to throw a number out there, but don't, so don't quote me on it, but like 75% of buildings need to be sprayed um, with uh, anti or insecticide, basically. And uh, so to save money and to accurately estimate the amount of insecticide different sprayers needed, um, we were able to map buildings in Mozambique and count the number of buildings and estimate the size of the buildings with OpenStreetMap data and estimate how much insecticide the program needed to purchase and use in each of these different villages that they were spraying. Um, so that's just like one example, but um, there's a broad range. So we're doing things like that. We're doing like Dara mentioned earlier, um, we're mapping infrastructure for a uh, electricity um, solar panel microgrid in Niger, Niger Sierra Leone. Um, the project that Adele mentioned related to COVID in the Hudson Valley. So it's kind of driven from the bottom up through, through youth mappers, but also top down through uh, different projects supporting USAID work. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. Thanks. I feel like I learned a million things about youth mappers that I did not know before. So that was fantastic.